I'd like to introduce our next speaker for the start the afternoon session, and that's Jason DeVoe. Dr. DeVoe holds a BSc and MSc and a PhD in plant cell physiology. He's worked for five years as a project and planning consultant for colleges and universities. And in 2008, he joined the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs as an application technology specialist, which is, as he calls it, AKA the spray guy. He's focused on developing educational materials for air blast sprayer operators, methods to optimize spray efficiency and effectiveness, and best practices for reducing spray waste and drift. And this afternoon, Dr. DeVoe is going to talk about pesticide drift and protection of water courses using vegetative filter strips, buffers, sorry, and tree resistance to pesticide drift. Good afternoon. That's, that's good. Well, good afternoon. Uh, in one regard, I'm glad I didn't follow Paul, who was an excellent speaker, but then again, I get all the full, happy, slightly drowsy people, and there's a movie in this talk, so I get to turn the lights out. <laughs> if I catch any of you sleeping, I get the full right to huff something at you, so just heads up. Uh, this is the first time I've delivered this talk, which means I've probably lightly stolen information from every other talk that you've heard today given that we have the experts of the field in the room, which is pretty cool. So let's just get rolling. Me, uh, kind of a strange pedigree. I was a research scientist for years, chained in a dark basement, quite frankly, literally chained in a dark basement as an electrophysiologist. So I was grounded all the time. And uh, <laughs> some architects came by and said, we're building a new building. How would you like to tell us what you need in your lab? I said, brilliant. And I rattled this off, and they came back a few months later and said, you speak English. What? No, no. All these other researchers hit us with gobbledygook about physics, and you told us, I need a shelf there, a door there, and how would you like to be a translator? These researchers can tell us what they want, and then you can slip in and tell us what they need, and that's a big difference, guys. And uh, I was tired of the dark, cold basement, and five years later, I woke up in Kuwait designing a university, and I went, what the heck just happened? Where'd all my Aggie go? So... OMAFRA had a position open up for a spray technologist, and uh, between the project consultation and working with particles from an electrophysiological point of view, I said, give me a chance. And they did, and it seems to be working out. I find myself in people's operations all the time causing trouble. So I'm going to give you a perspective of a, a windbreak uh, from the point of view of pesticide, something that we haven't put too fine a point on here so far. And while some of the principles are going to seem redundant, we're just going to kind of drill down uh, into what pesticide drift is, something I deal with quite a bit, and how windbreaks can help prevent that or greatly mitigate it. So what is pesticide drift? That's a heck of a question. It's a big question. And it's really contentious right now in agriculture. And recognizing this, some colleagues and I last year sat down and decided the fact sheet that we just wrote is strangely not stimulating. You know, who doesn't want to sit down and read eight pages of warnings and finger shaking from litigation? So we had the idea, given that growers are, there's a whole new generation of growers, I suppose there always is, let's do something a little more upbeat, a little more interesting, and let's do two videos, one on what is pesticide drift and what can we do to help mitigate and reduce pesticide drift, and let's make it as non-governmental as we can. The last thing we wanted was a mustachioed 75-year-old man in Ontario, pesticide drift. We really wanted to get away from that. And we're going to show you what that is uh, halfway through this talk. We'll watch that in a minute. And I do encourage you to go check it out yourself, uh, www.ontario.ca forward slash spray drift. Uh, a lot of you know this. Pesticide drift is bad. We, we don't like it. It can have a lot of adverse effects on a lot of different things. And I've seen you know, horrible pictures of children playing next to a pesticide sprayer, which is overly dramatic, but it is a metaphor. Uh, pesticide drift is bad because it's pesticide going where it was never intended to go. That can be uh, open water, that can be little animals, that can be areas where you know, there's human activity, but it can also be things that people don't talk about too much, like uh, residential gardens. I was called in recently, a friend of mine, a beautiful green thumb that goes right to his elbow and every crop he had around his house was white. There was a sweet potato grower nearby that got a little liberal one afternoon and decided he'd share his herbicide with everybody. So, you don't, you know, those problems either escalate and everyone hears about them or people just start fuming. Uh, one of the ones that we're focusing on is the increasing 
proximity, the rural urban interface. We've heard this many times. It's not just the lawyer who decides to retire to the country in the middle of a grain field and then is shocked by the odor and noise, but it's also the fact that a lot of grain crops are uh, abutting perennial crops. We, we end up with grapes that accidentally get drifted upon, and that doesn't just grow out. Those grapes are damaged for years, and you can just imagine the money associated with it. What can it do? This is a great shot from Mike Cobra. I don't know where he got it, but I've doctored it and made it mine. Herbicide was sprayed on soybean, glyphosate. Uh, meanwhile, next door, somebody was putting in tomatoes. Whoosh. That's vapor drift. That wasn't actually particle drift, and you'll hear more about that during the video. What is cool is just to your right of where the herbicide drift, look at this. How nice and clean is that? That's because after it drifted, they continued planting. So you can see, wow, it really does have an impact. And that was an unhappy person, I can tell you. <laughs> Something else that maybe doesn't always get netted in the economical impact is the bad relations. And this is what takes up so much time for professionals. Is <laughs> Communication is one of the best ways to prevent spray drift. Hi, I'm Farmer Fred, and we're doing this, and I want you to know about it, and I want you to know that I'm doing everything I can to prevent drift. If you have any questions, here are my spray records. Maybe we should plant a windbreak. Would you be interested if I donate the land? If you were to contribute a few dollars, we'd have something nice. I wish that happened more often. I drink a lot, so this is sort of utopian society in my mind. <laughs> so let me show you our five-minute blurb on what pesticide drift is, and then I'll get into the redundancy of telling you what a windbreak can do about it. We actually hired an actor for this because it turns out government people aren't good actors. <laughs> I disagree. Growers in Ontario follow integrated pest management programs to protect their crops from insects and disease. Spraying pesticide is often part of that program and the goal is to be safe, efficient and effective. Of course that's easier said than done. Typically there's a very small window of time available to apply pesticides and the weather doesn't always cooperate. Spraying under the wrong conditions such as on hot or windy days can cause off-target spray drift. Drift is possible every time the sprayer is turned on. Growers can reduce the impact by understanding the causes of pesticide drift and making adjustments. To understand how spray drifts, we have to look at droplet behavior. The forces acting on spray droplets include gravity, evaporation, wind, drag, and lift. Gravity pulls the droplet down out of the air. Evaporation makes droplets smaller. Wind will move droplets. Drag will slow droplets. Lift, which is rising air, carries small droplets upward. This end of the sprayed boom is equipped with nozzles that produce a very coarse droplet size. And this side, has nozzles that produce a fine droplet. Those fine droplets act like soap bubbles in the air and are carried off target by wind or rising hot air. Using coarser droplets gets more of the spray to the target. You may not see drift, but odds are it's happening. The shorter the distance between nozzle and target, the less impact the forces have on the spray. Don't get too close. Nozzles need a minimal distance to create a uniform pattern. Optimal distance is almost always indicated in the nozzle manufacturer's catalog.
This sprayer will produce fine droplets under high-powered lights to show you what you can't see during the day. It's just as dramatic when you're using a boom sprayer. Under the Pesticide Act, spray drift is illegal. Here's what happens when glyphosate is sprayed beside a tomato field. It can result in crop damage, yield loss, harvest delays, crop refusal, and bad relations. Drift damage to a permanent or multi-year crop, such as a vineyard, orchard, ginseng garden, or greenhouse, can be evident for numerous years. You can't change the weather, but you can adjust for it. Drift potential heightens as wind speed increases, so high speed or gusting winds should be avoided. Absolute calm conditions are not ideal for spraying either. Fine droplets may stay aloft. There is no sprayer, product, or management strategy that is drift proof. However, by understanding the causes of spray drift, following label guidelines, selecting appropriate equipment and making adjustments, the potential risk is significantly reduced. That was a lot of work. Spielberg called me like the week after we released it. He was <laughs> objective, but kind of cruel. So that was what is spray drift. And now we have an idea of how particles move, what spray drift really is. The second video, by the way, is what to do about it, but I'll let you find that on your own. Now, we know how particles behave. How does wind behave? Well, you heard how wind behaves. And just because I've redrawn some of these doesn't make it any different. Wind gets slowed down as you get closer to the ground. Those are boundary layers. Think of it as drag, wind actually scuffing against the ground. When you put an obstacle in the way, there's only so many things wind can do. It'll always follow the path of least resistance, and that could mean through, over, under, around. Depends what kind of obstacle we're talking about. Now, in this case, we have a tree with 50% optical porosity. We know what that is now. You can see through it, and that means that while some wind will sort of get ramped over the top, a lot is going to go through the tree, slowing, mixing, changing direction, depending on the conditions we're talking about. And on the lee side of the tree, downwind, we're going to see some changes in that wind. We're going to see an area of mixing where slow and turbulent wind is kind of abut against its neighbor up top, sort of become what it was before there was a windbreak. We're going to see some still areas at the bottom of the tree, again, depending on the shape of the tree, how the wind was before it hit there. And eventually, uh, here where it says F, at some point X from the tree, it's going to be as if the windbreak was never there. Now, that was 50% optical porosity. Let's put a really dense windbreak in the way and see what happens. We end up with evil Knievel jumping over buses. The wind cannot go through or under the trees. Instead, it's compressed, sped up, and forced to go over the tree. Now, you might think that that means the lee, the, the dead space, is going to be considerably further downwind. That's not always the case. In fact, quite often it's not the case. So depending on what kind of protection you're looking for, you can either get a considerable amount of protection downwind or you can get limited protection. So this is what I'm going to call, or other people have called, a narrow row vegetative barrier. You can see through it about 50%. From the point of view of a person spraying pesticide, you want to intercept the spray. You don't want to deflect it. You don't want that air to jump over the top and carry on its merry way. You want to filter it, which means you want something in the way that's going to have a lot of surface area to cause that pesticide-laden air to go through it, impact it, and deposit whatever load it's carrying. You hear about this with dust. You hear about this with lots of particulate matter. In the case of pesticides, though, you do want a lot of surface area and a lot of porosity. 
uh, a lot of studies have shown that you know, as a rule of thumb, your barrier should be twice as high as the height that the pesticide is released. That's a real fuzzy, friendly number. Uh, I work in horticultural crops, not so much with the bloom sprayers, but with their evil cousins, the air blast sprayers, whose job it is to fling pesticide several meters up in the air with enough air behind it that it can penetrate, say, an apple crop. Used correctly, these are great sprayers. Used incorrectly, there's something to see. Huge plumes. So how high does your vegetative barrier have to be then? I don't know. I don't know. High enough to physically intercept the spray. Then you have to ask yourself, well, I'm spraying this whole orchard. If I spray way over here, and your barrier is way over there, that spray has a lot of opportunity to go pretty high up in the air, which means, again, it's not going to intercept the barrier. So you're constantly working with, where am I spraying? Where is the wind? How high should my barrier be? And how close can I get it to the point of release without causing trouble? A lot of things to be considered. And thank goodness there are conservation people out there to help you with that. Um, so the, the rule of two times the release height of the pesticide, I think that really depends on what you're spraying and how you're spraying. Now, finally, here's spray-laden air, just to sort of put a fine point on it. The pesticide concentration doesn't change before the barrier, although it may compress up front. It is filtered as it passes through, and when it re-equilibrates, at least the wind, when it returns to what the wind was pre-barrier, the hope is it has less pesticide in it than it did at the other end. And of course it will, because the pesticide is going to shrink in concentration as it disperses. There's going to be evaporation. You know, it's just going to go up, up, and away and never come down. There are a lot of reasons for it. What's interesting is this narrow row of vegetative barrier, which is to say, say one tree row with 50% optical porosity, creates a nice little scrub layer behind, oops, too far, that we're going to call local protection. Whatever is just behind that tree, say open water, or some item that you don't want damaged, it's going to give excellent protection. But X number of meters downwind, that pesticide concentration is going to return pretty close to what it was before the tree, depending on how much was filtered out, how far down it is, and how much had a chance to disperse. So, enter the wide vegetative buffer strip. This is scrub grass, this is things about waist high, and its little trick is that it sort of relies on its surface area above ground to scrub whatever pesticide goes over the top. In this case, we've got the spray release and it's passing over this wide, low vegetative buffer strip. Uh, but this time, your protected zone is actually further downwind than it was with that narrow row, which is kind of interesting. This is a generality. There are always exceptions to these rules. But we call this regional protection. It's going to offer more protection downwind than it would have otherwise granted very close to the ground. So if someone's thinking, hmm, I just had a neighbor move in, he wants to plant grapes and I'm doing field crops, you know, you're going to want to talk to this individual about your practices, your spraying practices, and where you guys can find common ground. Uh, what kind of barrier, if any, are we going to need to make this work? In 08, they did a study at the University of Guelph where they said, maybe we don't have to plant. Why don't we use snow fencing? We'll use a, a physical barrier that isn't necessarily vegetative. And they use different combinations. They had this fencing and a 10 meter wide vegetative buffer strip. And they kind of combined these in different ways to see how far they could get protection. So this fence is about 50%. That is to say, there's as much no fence as there is fence. They used that in one study. Then they took another set of fencing and laid it perpendicular. So they had about 25% optical porosity. And off they went to spray. What they found was the wide vegetative buffer strip, the scrub, alone gave a lot of good drift protection from a field sprayer as much as 100 meters downwind at a 14 kilometer an hour wind. In that situation, just that buffer strip gave good protection. Uh, but when wind conditions went higher, greater than 14 kilometers an hour, which sadly some people still spray in, adequate protection was given by the same 10 meter buffer strip with the fence. They need both of them working collaboratively to make the same difference. Uh, they also looked at a 10 meter wide vegetative buffer strip with a 20 meter wide, that is no spray zone. Now this is where the egghead, hey, you know, let's just leave more space and we'll plant scrub and we'll put a little shrub row there and all it's gonna cost you is 40 meters of unsprayed land. When do we plant? <laughs> You're gonna see a lot of angry growers, they won't do it. 
sadly with our legislature the way it is now, people who are familiar with buffer zones, which is to say a no sprayed area downwind between a grower and something that needs protection, were you to plant a windbreak or put one of these no spray zones, <laughs> that actually adds to the distance. The windbreak itself in some cases becomes a protected area. So you have to start counting further up from the windbreak. I haven't heard that today. I don't know why, but it makes growers head spin. Wait a second. So I'm not allowed to spray the last 30 meters? No, that's what the label says. And I took the onus to plant this beautiful tree row and this kind of low vegetative area up front? Yes, you did. And that doesn't count within the 30 meters? No, you add that on to the 30 meters, because now we have to protect that. That's become a natural refuse for animals and all kinds of things. Well, I'm not going to plant it. In fact, I'm going to fill that stream in, because this is a pain in the butt. And that happens more often than we care to admit. So some take-home points of, of windbreaks, and you, I've kind of avoided calling them windbreaks. What's interesting here is Something that works to stop pesticide drift may not necessarily fit the other criteria for windbreaks as we've heard them today. Odor control, visual control, slowing wind, snow, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes it does, but the qualities that someone needs to make a pesticide barrier versus some of those other objectives, uh, they may not go hand in hand. Again, which is why you should contact a, a CA and ask them to help build the windbreak that's right for you. So some things that I found in my literature review, thin, rough foliage, go from base to crown, which is to say no big open holes at the bottom of trees. Path of least resistance says that pesticide-laden air is just going to go that way. And the scanthus, which is something we've been working with for a little while now, is uh, sort of biomass, does a pretty good job of filtering, and uh, it grows forever. Trees with small and or hairy leaves maximize droplet interception. Needles beat leaves. More surface area, more opportunity for contact with pesticide-laden air. Row barriers should have about 50% optical porosity. Again, a generalization, the point being that spray-laden air has to pass through the barrier to some extent. You can't just ramp over it or you've just got the same problem 20 meters downwind. Mixed plantings are multiple bands of highly porous trees, and, you know, no big gaps, more opportunity for surface area. Uh, the whole idea of two times the pesticide release height is more of a way to get a person thinking, how high does this need to be to be effective? How far away from where pesticide is released will this be effective? Which is to say it should be as close as possible to the spray zone so more is intercepted. And I'm seeing that a combination of this wide, low vegetative barrier, which becomes a no spray zone, in combination with sort of a narrow tree band would be a good idea. The low stuff is on the sprayer side. It does a great deal of the scrubbing ahead of time. And then you reach a porous windbreak where it does considerably more, which should collectively give you more protection on the lee side. And lastly, a windbreak is not necessarily a vegetative barrier to pesticide drift. They may be the same thing, they may not, depending on what needs to be protected and where that thing is in relation to the barrier. So uh, these are all the papers I rudely plagiarized, and since I've listed them here, I'm absolved. And I thank a lot of the people in the room that I think worked over the last 20 years to develop the data that I may or may not that just delivered to you incorrectly. Thank you very much. I'll take any questions.